Well, hello. My name is Catherine Wisner. I'm with the University of Wyoming Laramie County Extension Office down here in Cheyenne. And my program is on alternative, non-toxic, kind of organic approach to insects and pest control in your vegetable garden. So I'm going to um, share my screen here. And so um, I'm going to change the what you're going to look at. And Get back up to the top. And so here we go. Again, the title of my program is Alternative Non-Chemical Pest Control for Vegetable Gardens. And pesticides, poor soil, vegetable gardens really don't get along. So, so you, you want to have healthy soil. And healthy soil is will get you healthy plants and it'll also help you reduce some of your insect pressures. So how do you know if you've got healthy soil? What is healthy soil? Well, get a soil test. Easy, inexpensive. Um, get on Colorado State University's website. They've got a great soils lab and send them a sample for a nominal amount of money. They will send you back a wealth of information that is very understandable, very easy to read. And you can always call them to get clarification or you can call us, even better yet, you call your extension office and we will certainly help you out on that. But again, pesticides, poor soils and vegetables, it sets you up for failure. So we're gonna talk about some alternatives, how to kind of combat some of these problems, set yourself up for success ahead of time so you're not all of a sudden going, oh my gosh, I got insects, now I gotta do something. And we're going to deal with it through what we call integrated pest management, IPM. And this is where we look at the least toxic solution first and we work our way up that ladder. But we always want to start with the least toxic method first. And so we do some detective work up ahead. And if you were to come to one of us and say, you know, I'm having problems in my garden, the first thing I'm going to ask you is what have you amended your soil with? because that's really what's gonna make or break your vegetable garden or your flower bed or any, almost anything that you're gonna to try to grow is what have, you, have, what have you done or not done with the soils? So we start with the basics. I start at the bottom and I look at that soil because it's so important to plant growth and to whether you have insects or not. So healthy soil, healthy plants and fewer pest problems. Now, healthy soils doesn't mean that you're going to load up it with a lot of fertilizer or manures. That is not how you get a healthy soil. So a quick review of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, are those three mystery numbers on a bag or box of fertilizer. First number is always going to be nitrogen. Nitrogen tells a plant to grow. Sometimes it tells a plant to grow a lot. And too much of that, a lot of growth invites insects. So if you've grabbed that bag, <laughs> pick on miracle Grow, grab that miracle Grow, and you're adding a lot of it to your vegetable garden or your flower bed, you will have insect problems because it's so high in nitrogen. So nitrogen is not necessarily your best friend in the vegetable garden, unless you're growing sweet corn and then your corn wants you know, use that on your on your sweet corn. But a vegetable garden wants to have a lower amount of nitrogen. And that nitrogen is what drives the insect cycle a lot of times. So keep that low. The middle number of phosphorus is what tells plants to put down good strong roots, put on flowers and fruit. And it also is um, it doesn't break down very quickly. So this is one that you need to put in early in the season, mend it into the soil, get it in there. And then the last number, potassium, is uh, naturally occurring in our soil, so we don't need a lot. Vegetable gardens do need um, more. Um, your tomatoes and your potatoes will need more just for um, good growth, good quality fruit. I make my own fertilizer. Uh, so I'm a geeky horticulturist and I make my own. And when I do the Master Gardener program, I teach my students how to make their own fertilizers because I think that's an important thing to know to do. And my attitude is if you're gonna be a Master Gardener, you should know how to do this. If you're a vegetable gardener, you should know how to do this too. 
easy, it's inexpensive. My base is always with alfalfa pellets. And if all you do is soak a pound of alfalfa pellets in a five gallon bucket of water overnight and then fertilize with that, you are miles ahead of any fertilizer that you will buy. Alfalfa pellets are, are used by the American Hosta Association and the American Iris Association for fertilizing those plants. I've been using them in my garden for 20 years and it, it's never caused me any problems. So that's kind of my base on it and easy to use, inexpensive. If you don't know what your soil has, if you don't know what that NPK is, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, if you don't know what the pH is, you don't know what the salts are, get a soil test and it will tell you where you're at. It'll tell you what you're missing, what you need to add. Um, it's worth the money. It's worth the price to get into there. So rototilling, <laughs> this is um, another interesting area that um, my husband loves to rototill and, and he would he'd probably be out there for a day just, just tilling. The more rototilling, the more tillage you do, the more you break down your soil. The more you incorporate air, the more that organic material breaks down. You can even start causing more compaction. That rototiller goes around and at the bottom of that, you're gonna get a layer of compaction. So once around the patch, and then stop. More is more rototilling is not better. Recreational tillage is just do it once and then get, and then put the, the tool away. Also, some other things to never add to your soil. Uh, again, our soils are naturally high in calcium, which is also lime. You don't ever want to add wood ash, fireplace ash. Both of those, when you run water through it, creates lye, and lye has got a pH of 14. Your vegetable garden likes to have a pH of around six and a half to six. So you never want to raise that pH. You always want to try to lower the pH. A vegetable gardener is going to be a crazy person trying to lower that, and that's okay but you never want to try to raise that pH. And lime, wood ash, fireplace ash will all do that. They'll all just really wreak havoc with your, with your vegetable garden. Lawn fertilizers, don't ever put lawn fertilizers in your vegetable garden. They are just so inconsistent in how they're made. And when they switch from doing a weed and feed to a regular lawn fertilizer, you have no guarantee that they've cleaned between products and you could be inadvertently putting down an herbicide in your vegetable garden. And that's just never a good thing. And then of course my manures, I don't like adding manures to vegetable gardens. I raise sheep, I raise cattle, and I never put any of that stuff in my vegetable garden. It's, I don't know what the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is in there. I don't know what the salts are. I'm gonna assume the salts are high because I've got salt blocks out for my animals. I know they use them. And so what goes in one side comes out the other side, right? And so any excess salt is going to show up in the manures. And salt in your vegetable garden is just a real dead end. And you can actually create a very toxic soil by adding too much manures. And horse manure, weed seeds, lots and lots of weed seeds. So you really want to avoid horse manure because you will just inoculate your garden with weed seeds that you'll just never overcome that one. So get again, <laughs> I'm repeating myself, get a soil test, um, but do add quality organic matter to your soil. So quality organic matter is gonna be your kitchen scraps. My husband loves to do juicing, he eats oranges. All of that goes into the vegetable garden. Um, potato peelings, um, eggshells, all those kitchen scraps go into my vegetable garden. Clean straw, lawn clippings, lawn clippings that haven't been treated with a with an herbicide or weed and feed. Um, those go, those are that's amazing in a vegetable garden. Coffee grounds, don't be throwing all those coffee grounds away. Filter and all, all that breaks down in the soil, and just adds some amazing tilth. Tilth is the ability of the soil to grow things in. So peat moss leaves at the end of the 
the season in the fall, take those leaves. And don't put them out on the curb. Don't burn them. Put them in your vegetable garden. That is free fertilizer, free organic material. And it, it's like it's like putting gardener's gold into your soil. It's, it does some amazing things for your soil, rebuilding the organic material and putting down a slow release fertilizer. So something that is released over a long period of time. So it's constantly feeding your soil and feeding that, that um, those plants. So you think your garden might have bugs, probably does and it should. It should have a balance of both good bugs and bad bugs. And so there, there little battles are going on all the time in your garden and you don't, you're probably not even aware of it. I've watched some pretty amazing things occur in my vegetable garden that, you know, it's like, darn, where's the camera when I needed it? But when you plant a lot of flowers, annuals, perennials, you're gonna bring in the good guys and those good guys are going to be taking care of the bad guys. And, and there are some, some interesting um, little um, balances that go on. And you can plant trap crops to also help catch the bad guys. And this um, helps improve your yields. If you can take the bad guys and say, hey, come over here and eat this plant instead. And you want to put your trap crops out on the perimeter of your garden so that the bad guys go out there and eat on something you don't care about. And then you've got flowering plants in there that attract your beneficial insects. And then those beneficial insects go after the bad bugs. A lot of times um, there's this really cool little insect. It's called a bee fly, B-E-E -E fly, bee fly. And it's this little tiny yellow fuzzy big eye, it's got a long proboscis, so it's a proboscis, so it's, um, it's a nectar drinker, but it lays its eggs on aphids. Cool, that's what we like. So that's, that's one of the battles that goes on. And then there's, there's other insects that, that think aphids are a great snack. And, and so you wanna have this balance going on and you wanna have your good bugs doing your work for you and not ever reaching for an insecticide. I've been vegetable gardening since I was 12. <laughs> I dug up part of my dad's backyard and I have never ever used an insecticide in my life. I've never had to because I've always had this balance of good guys and bad guys and the good guys take care of the bad guys. I've always had flowers, I've always had trap crops. And so that helps, but healthy soil is incredibly important too. You can plant some buckwheat. Buckwheat's gonna flower and it's gonna attract both the good guys and the bad guys. I've never had a problem with buckwheat getting out of control here in Wyoming. It, we just don't have enough moisture to keep it perpetual. So it, it's something that you're gonna have to replant every season. Um, buckwheat tracks stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs, so it pulls them away from your vegetables. Flowers are a great source of pollen and nectar for your native bees. And if you, if you catch this crop before it flowers, so you can plant it a couple times because it's very fast, you can actually plow it down or turn it under. You can, you can go rototill this thing in, and it acts as what we call a green manure, and so that helps put in more organic material that breaks down and again, Slow release fertilizer, so it lasts a little long season. So green manure crop is, is a green growing plant that you have just plowed under. And there's also uh, mustards and collards that you can grow again on the perimeter of your vegetable garden to attract bad guys. So let them flower, let them go to and bloom and they'll attract your I attract both good guys and bad guys, but they pull them away from your vegetable garden because they're more enticing than what's in that what you're trying to grow. Okay, so if none of this stuff is working and you're still having problems, um, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you what are you fertilizing your garden with? Because if you're using high nitrogen fertilizers, if you're using Miracle Grow, you're gonna be having more bug problems. But if it's kind of after the fact safer soap or you can make a homemade soap safer soap um, 
is already pre-made and it's easy to use, comes a little spray bottle. Read the directions before you use it. It's a contact um, soft insecticide, which is non-selective. Um, BT is also a really good, but it's very selective. So you've got, you've got to know what insect you're going after to use uh, BT. Again, it's a very soft insecticide, but again, um, read the instructions so you know, read the label so you know what insect you're going after. And if you don't know what, what the insects are, either take pictures of them and then get back to um, your county extension office and then we can figure out what those bugs are and help you treat them. Diatomaceous earth, DE, it's, it only works for soft body insects. And DE is the um, decomposed um, skeleton remains of little plankton. And if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like um, glass. So for a soft bodied insect, it's like, it's like walking across broken glass. And so it abrades the insect, but it's gotta be a soft bodied insect like your aphids. Um, there are plant-based insecticides that you can get. There's a, there's a whole list of them. Um, Perethrins are some of them, but again, um, non-selective, a lot of them. And, and you wanna really be careful with your native bees and your butterflies. Butterflies are incredibly sensitive to insecticides. It's very easy to kill them. Butterflies are very fragile insects. So read, read the label, know what you're going after before you use a plant-based because just because it's plant-based doesn't mean that it's harmless to the good guys. Um, plant-based can be pretty, pretty wicked. Pheromone traps, I like I like to use pheromone traps and I encourage people to use them, especially in their apples. Um, coddling moth, um, put a pheromone trap in and um, some of the research coming out on it now says to put them in, uh, put pheromone traps into your apple trees and just leave them in there all season. And these are just little, either like round spheres, little red round spheres with a sticky trap on them or the little tents that attract um, the moth into the little tent and then they get stuck on glue and stay there. Um, there's various tobacco products out there. You can, you can actually take tobacco and sprinkle it on the plants um, or on, on the soil and water it in if there's like fungus snap problems that work for that sticky traps. I like to use yellow sticky traps to kind of scout for bad bugs. And a lot of times I unfortunately catch a lot of good guys in there too, but it's a, it's a fun quiz to take a yellow sticky trap and, and take it into the extension office and go through the books and try to figure out what bugs are all stuck on that. Neem oil, uh, again, it's another plant-based insecticide, but it's non-selective. Yeah, we'll also take out your, your bees, your native bees, your butterflies. So you've got to be very careful with that. Flowers. Just planting flowers, you know, your trap crops and, and pulling them away from, from uh, the main crop it is how I do it. It's so much easier. Um, once in a while, I do have to reach for a plant-based insecticide, especially if I'm growing cabbage or um, cauliflower, broccoli, because those little white caterpillars, they will make you crazy. Those little butterflies. Weeds. Here's another one that, um, again, I like to put a mulch down first, a black plastic mulch and then straw in between those rows so they're not fighting the weeds so bad. But just hor just vinegar, you can take your regular 5% vinegar, you know, buy the cheapest vinegar you can find and full strength, just um, spray the plant with it. And that's all it takes, it's contact herbicide. It's non-selective. Again, that means it will take out anything it touches. So you've got to be very careful when you apply it. So apply with caution. And there is a horticulture vinegar out there that's 20%. All of the, the vinegars are really good for your annuals, for your annual weeds, but they don't really cause a lot of damage to your perennial weeds like your thistle. And thistle's got a very deep, extensive root system to it. And it, the vinegar, vinegar will knock down the top part of it for a while, and then the plant just pushes back some more green stuff. So you have to keep 
keep on it. Persistence is the buzzword with weeds, persistence. You just have to keep at it. And it's like bindweed. I always get phone calls about, well, how do I control bindweed? And it's like persistence. You just, persistence. <laughs> you just have to stay on top of it. You just have to keep applying your vinegar to it to make it go away. Because the, the root systems on your perennial plants, huge, very extensive, very huge. But your vinegar works well on your annuals. It knocks them back really fast. And uh, puncture vine is one that the vinegar, vinegar works really well on. I usually hand dig that one out. Um, if you got a real extensive patch of it, um, vinegar, and then go back in and try to rake out the seed heads. Um, so again, um, mulch. I, I really believe in mulching because I don't want to weed. I don't want to battle weeds. And also the mulching also helps keep some of the disease pressures down. So if I'm not having weeds, I'm not always having a lot of insect problems and I'm not harboring a lot of other, other diseases that could uh, go after my vegetable garden. Grass clippings, shredded leaves, there's pine needles. People throw pine needles away and I just, I, why? They smell so good and they're so beneficial. And so the myth on pine needles is it makes your soil acidic. Yeah, total myth, total myth. It, it, it doesn't. It, and you're in a vegetable garden. Remember, you want that soil acidic anyway. So I've always mulched and rototilled in pine needles into my vegetable garden, along with shredded leaves and all this other stuff. Um, trying to build that soil organic layer up. But pine needles, that's a whole garden myth. That's, a, that's just total urban myth about that, that acid thing. Um, wood chips, bark sawdust. They're, they're great for mulch, but they do cause some other problems when they decompose. And so you kind of have to be mindful of that. I like black plastic. I can go to the big box hardware stores or your local hardware store and you can get mulch. Um, get that plastic, they, they'll give it to you. Free, come get it. So this mulch, this black plastic comes on those big, um, banks of wood, bunks of wood, big bunks of wood. And the one side is white and the other side is black. And that's so all, you just throw it away. So go fetch it and use it in your garden, just lay it out and it suppresses the weeds, warms up your soil, plants love that. Newspaper works, I, it won't decompose, it doesn't really go away in our soils, but that also works as a mulch. Um, landscaping fabric works. Um, so you can be pretty creative. I've seen master gardeners get pretty creative using, using mulches. But again, the mulch is there to help conserve water. It holds the water in. It, you know, this is a dry state. We're always in a drought. We're just, some years are better than others. Um, so it helps hold water in, suppresses weeds, helps moderate the temperature. So especially in a vegetable garden where you're trying to hold heat in, especially for your warm season vegetables, your tomatoes, your peppers, um, okra, um, eggplant, cucumbers, green beans, those guys all like to have warm soil. So this helps hold that soil temperature, helps keep it a little bit warmer, helps reduce compaction, um, helps reduce crusting of the soil. So if you're using straw or grass clippings, that's where it's gonna help reduce that crusting of the soil um, and compaction. So it helps on that. So hopefully these tips will help you have a little bit better garden and fewer problems in the upcoming growing season. So I hope everybody has a great and fun gardening season. If you have problems, by all means, call your county extension office and we would love to help you.